So let's let's uh, move to. Uh, oh, uh, let me ask you this question before we move to another topic. You're the editor in chief of of uh, a major cognitive journal called Schizophrenia Research Cognition. Uh, what kind of emphasis do you notice that the, your authors are focusing on? Is it the neurocognition, the social cognition, or something in between? What we're seeing a lot of now, which is really important, is people trying to understand the cascade from cognition or social cognition to real world outcomes. Uh -huh. And there's this other concept that's a very simple concept, but it's important to think about, which is functional capacity. So the path between impaired cognition and impaired outcome is that impaired cognition makes it hard for you to do the skills that are necessary to do things like transportation. It's hard to take the bus if you can't figure out how to read the schedule. It's hard to cook your meals if you, if you can't do grocery shopping. And similarly, uh, at the level of social functional capacity, social skills, social competence is something that correlates with social cognition, but then predicts social outcomes. So the idea is that you need to measure both basic abilities as well as what I would call applied abilities. Can the person uh, navigate a real world situation uh, in order to do something? Can they go to a supermarket and shop? And that's the functional skill. The cognitive abilities underpin that considerably. But the, the ability to actually cook a meal at home in the real world is related to your ability to perform shopping skills in a simulated situation. We've seen a lot of that stuff. And the other thing we're seeing recently is stuff on the genomics of cognition, which is more complicated, but probably no less important. So, uh, so it, it's the cognitive impairment in schizophrenia, and, and let's face it there, there, it, there is a cognitive impairment, but is it on a, on a normal distribution curve, a bell-shaped curve? So some, some patients are, are much more with it than others, and some are very disabled by it. Uh, and, and to what extent uh, do, do, is that, does that have real life implications? Because some patients with schizophrenia have jobs and others don't. Uh, so is the, is the, is the cogn cognitive impairment uh, uh, on, a, on a normal distribution curve compared to normal people? You know, that's a really important question and there is an answer to it. What, what it looks like is that the distribution of cognitive abilities in people with schizophrenia is normal, but shifted down. So the mean of the cognitive abilities of people with schizophrenia is lower than the mean of cognitive abilities of the general population by about what would be referred to as a standard deviation, which is about, you know, 20%, the equivalent of 15 IQ points. All these things converge. That's not to say that people with schizophrenia started out there uniformly. That's where they wind up. The distribution of uh, cognitive performance prior to the development of the earliest signs of the illness is not markedly less than the general population. But it seems like the illness causes a shift to the left in a normal distribution there, meaning that the people at the high end of the distribution are within the normal range, 15%, 20% are totally within the normal range. And yes, there is a correlation between having normal cognitive functioning and being able to live independently and sustaining employment. The implications, though, for the ones at the lower end of the distribution is that they're quite far down. And they're certainly in the realm of cognitive abilities that make most jobs challenging and make living independent challenging without some other assistance. So, so one of, speaking of, of before the, the onset of the illness, you know, the, the big field of research in the prodrome, which is the, one or two years before the onset of the first episode of psychosis, there's evidence that the cognitive uh, functions start deteriorating and the grades in school start going down a year or two before the onset of psychosis. So does that mean that a cognition starts deteriorating just before the onset of the illness? Well, what you find is that there's multiple levels, to, to anal levels of analysis to analyze that question. If you look at the academic performance uh, in early childhood of individuals who eventually develop schizophrenia compared to the general group, there's a small difference that would not actually be detectable on an individual case basis most of the time. However, a certain subgroup of people, when they begin showing these prodromal symptoms that you're talking about, showing evidence particularly of social decline, but also of decline in school, 
uh, a number of them, probably 20% of them, are also experiencing cognitive decline. The research on the program, program has revealed three things. One is that the majority of people who look like they're prodromal do not become psychotic. Uh, the only majority of people... Two, roughly one third only become psychotic. Absolutely. The majority of the people who look like they're prodromal actually recover, and a recent study showed that they recover both cognitively and functionally. But there's a substantial group that doesn't recover and doesn't become psychotic. And those are people who tend to be chronically disabled and marginally functioning. They might get a diagnosis of schizotypal personality disorder or some other atypical condition, but their cognitive challenges are present, not as severe as those who become psychotic, but considerably worse than those who recover. Good point. Uh, actually, I, I remember reading a study from Europe that uh, patients with schizophrenia, and they look back on their school performance, they do uh, testing in schools, and they found that even at age seven, as you said, there was a group difference between those kids who later developed schizophrenia and those who did not. So it may be like built in from birth. Well, clearly there are genomic contributions to schizophrenia. It's not, uh, it's not like Huntington's disease. It's not like parents do anything wrong to give their kids schizophrenia. But clearly one of the features that co-varies with eventually developing schizophrenia is having ongoing lifelong cognitive challenges that are more subtle earlier and greater later. The problem is those subtle challenges are not severe enough to trigger an intervention. It's like, you know, in second grade, you cannot go through and pick out who's going to develop schizophrenia based on their test scores. Uh, our good friend Nancy Andreessen, who's from Iowa, where they give everyone the Iowa achievement test, was able to show quite convincingly that people who develop schizophrenia didn't necessarily start out tremendously low. They just didn't keep up. And so as other people's scores got better, that's when they started to fall behind. Not, not that they looked like they had intellectual disability in second grade, but that they looked like they were in fourth grade when they were in eighth grade. So it's still not so extreme. It would trigger a special education intervention, but it's a subtle sign. All right. So before we go to treatment, which is very important, of course, uh, one last question. So uh, speaking of this deterioration issue, uh, if someone starts out as a genius, and we have some patients with schizophrenia who were like literally geniuses with IQ of 150, 160 before the onset, uh, how, much, how much do they lose of that high IQ once they become psychotic and start the illness? Roughly. I think the classic example is John Nash, right? Everyone, everyone's familiar with his story. He had very good pro, uh, pre-morbid functioning. He did research that won the Nobel Prize. But then after he developed schizophrenia, he manifested a decline in his functioning that made employment very difficult for him. If we had done an IQ test on him, his IQ probably still would have been 130 uh, when it probably was as hot, you know, 165, which is the highest score you can get at the beginning. But that within person change is enough of a shock to your system that it interferes with your functioning. All of a sudden you can't do the things that you did before. And what happened with Professor Nash, which was interesting, is it shows you the connection between <laughs> genius awareness of illness and psychosis, because when they asked him uh, in the hospital, well, Professor Nash, how could you get the idea that aliens were trying to kidnap you when you're such a smart person that you won the Nobel Prize? He said, well, those ideas came to me in the same way as my mathematical ideas. I had no reason to doubt them. And that's, I think that's a very striking uh, and insightful comment, which is that it doesn't matter how intelligent you are. If it's your idea, you tend to believe it. And so... <laughs> which showed you that creativity and madness is, are two sides of the same coin in a way. Yeah, uh, more so in bipolar disorder. And, you know, in a, in a study that we did in collaboration with some people at Johns Hopkins University, we had... Uh, a person in our study who had bipolar disorder who was the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And he'd been functioning his whole life because his bipolar disorder tended to be episodic. Uh, and he, he, his cognitive performance was actually uh, amazingly, remarkably good as evidenced by the fact he was succeeding as a Fortune 500 CEO. We talked about distributions before. The bipolar disorder distribution is also shifted to the left. It just may start out a little bit further to the right, if you're thinking, yeah. thinking about it, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And there's some reason to believe that people with bipolar disorder do have changes in their cognitive ability. It's just that they wind up being left in a better place because they started in a somewhat higher place. Well, actually, the research shows that, that the people with bipolar disorder have, have superior vocabulary to, to compared to the rest of us. But, uh, but their memory and executive function actually can be impaired. Absolutely. We've done a lot of research on cognition of bipolar disorder. We find it very interesting, and we recently published a paper suggesting that what, in line with what you said, the genomic influences on cognition in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder may very well be the same. So what you did was you separated out vocabulary, which is crystallized knowledge, which is developed before the illness begins. And we said before, even in people with schizophrenia, your vocabulary is a good index of what, you, of what your optimal performance was. But then what we see is, yes, their working memory, processing speed, and attention gets impacted in some cases. And the reason for the impact may very well be the same as the impact that we see in schizophrenia.